Brian, I want to go back for a second because I'm wondering if maybe some of the audience, of course, obviously, myself included, have heard about treating things with psilocybin. That's been out there for a few years now, hearing about that. And hearing a little bit about other things of, you know, people taking ketamine. Um, I don't know if it's because at 17, I had a terrible experience outside of a nightclub and I would rather stick needles in my eyes than even hear the word ketamine again. And I appreciate that's not the application. But nevertheless, like you hear about these different types of um, psychedelics and what have you, even acid. I don't know who's applying that or studying it, but ayahuasca being another one. One thing that seems to be a through line without question is that where you have a plant-based medicine in a region, peyote, uh, the desert, Native Americans, uh, ayahuasca, a root and a, I think a shrub brought together by indigenous people in the Amazon. Obviously, who knows where, you know, what, what indigenous people were utilizing these. I've seen it in other parts of South America, so on and so forth. It seems as though God or nature or however we want to label it <clears throat> has put these plant medicines around the globe. And indigenous people seem to use these medicines all in the same way, the same capacity. They liken it as a connection to God. I've heard they even put ayahuasca, they give newborn babies sips of ayahuasca and have ceremonies for 12-year-olds with it. In looking at these different medications, what are the similarities and what are the differences? Let's just take psilocybin, ayahuasca, I don't know, peyote is far less frequent, so, and ibogaine. Same, different. What do you see there? I would group psilocybin and mescaline slash peyote and, and other cacti from which it derived and group them within the umbrella of what we would call the classical psychedelics. These are the ones that everybody knows. You know, They create ones within the brain that are often what I would describe as dissociative, meaning they're going to get a hold of you and they're going to take you where they're going to take you uh -huh. in terms of the psychoactive experience they produce. It is my understanding that ayahuasca has, and I've never had an ayahuasca experience. It's one about which I'm highly curious. I've done it once. I've done it once. It's very visual. It is very intelligent. It is very profound and beautiful. It can also be very disciplinary and, and harsh, depending on what that's, experience That's is. exactly what it did to me. Uh, and I wanted the opposite, and it was like, no, we're not going this way, and yeah. you don't make the rules. And it was like a disciplinary parent and there's no choice in it. Nope. When it's there, you're going to get what it's going to give That's you. That's right. And that applies with psilocybin. That applies with peyote slash mescaline. They're going to take you where they're going to take you in terms of that introspective journey. Right. And you're not going to have any volitional control but to go through what it's going to take you through. Ibogaine is distinct in the following way. And I, I would add also that each of those have the capacity to produce a, a very ecstatic, blissful, happy feeling if that is what it's going to deliver for you when, once it happens. But it is something uh, that negates the person's volitional action mm -hmm. within it. It's just going to, it's going to do what it's going to do. Yep. Ibogaine is different on several fronts. Number one, you have to be in a scenario whereby you are at all times medically monitored. There okay. is a very real cardiac risk that comes with Ibogaine treatment, and that risk is manifest as the propensity for the time in between heartbeats to slow if there is a misadministration of dosage. So if you give someone too much, it can cause a slowing of the heart rate to the point of stoppage, cardiac arrest, Scary. and death. Right. It is a very serious medication, and it requires the delivery by medical professionals who know what they're doing. Or, in the case of those with indigenous knowledge, the administration by those spiritual masters within, within the cultural context who know what they're doing. You need expert hands to do it. Number two, it is not dissociative. While an individual may close their eyes and begin to see images that are rooted in their life and who they are, if at any time they don't want to experience it, they just have to open their eyes. 
If I were to sit here and receive Ibogaine within an hour of it taking full effect, I could sit up in my bed where I would be laying and I could be as conversant with you as coherently as I am right now. You are at all times within yourself. You are in full volitional control of your mind, if not your body, because you can't walk, and sometimes you're throwing up. But from a cognitive perspective, you're oriented to time, place, and people around you at all times. It gives you, at all times, a choice to engage it for the introspective benefits that it can produce if you want it. It is a respecter of personal autonomy. And the only way that you will have that experience is if you close your eyes. The other thing that I would add is while I understand ayahuasca is not necessarily recreational, psilocybin can be. Of course. Certainly LSD can be. Certainly MDMA can be. There is no recreational or party use for Uh Ibogaine. Most of you folks who are going to watch this or listen to it are going to say, hmm, I've never heard of this. Yeah. And the reason why is because you ain't going to have a party on Ibogaine. There are no Ibogaine raves. There's no Ibogaine gatherings in the underground. If we think about the black market economy, for everything for which there is a recreational application, there's a smuggling ring and there is an underground economy to distribute opium, and poppies from Afghanistan, Uh the coca leaf from South America, meth from pills boiled down in the backyard from the drugstore. Pick the substance that can produce a party and there's a black market. There is no black market for Ibogaine. Nobody's going and raiding the west coast of Africa to bring the Iboga root back to the United States for people to have Ibogaine raves. And I'll tell folks, if your idea of a good time is being in a state of semi-paralysis where you require assistance to make it to a bathroom and you're throwing up for 12 hours, then you're going to have a good damn time. But if that is not your idea of a party... You ain't going to have one because that's what comes with the experience. It is going to lay you low physically. It restores your mind and gives you the opportunity to explore who you are and the nature of the life you have led in the past and what you wish for it to be in the future. And I would distill it in this way. And when we were going through the process of pursuing an effort in Kentucky that would have seen the state take a small percentage of its settlement funds to match with a drug developer to basically push it through the FDA's approval process as a breakthrough treatment for opioid dependence, I would say Ibogaine has three properties. Number one, it resolves physiological substance dependency within an accelerated time frame. We've discussed that. From a psychological perspective, individuals who receive Ibogaine come through the other side with a or perhaps for the first time, a sense of full ownership of their selves and their future, whereby they no longer view themselves as victims of compulsion or the prisoners of disease. They see themselves as fully independent actors whose lives will be defined by volitional choice as opposed to be driven by the prior compulsion rooted in their substance dependence. There's no greater gift that we can give someone for the most part, except for the third one I'll articulate, than a sense of ownership over their life and destiny. If a person doesn't feel that they have any say-so whatsoever in how their future plays out, you've got a hopeless and broken human being. And then thirdly, the only thing which surpasses, in my mind, the physiological and psychological benefits of an Ibogaine treatment is that which is endorsed by many people who receive the treatment as an absolute concrete affirmation of their human divinity and their identity as a spiritual being whose essence is connected to an eternal creator whose nature is that of almighty unconditional love and who also has a unique and special purpose for their life. In my opinion, at the root of all trauma and all addiction is profound spiritual affliction that is rooted in our disconnection from our individual divinity. And if making Ibogaine available as an additional therapeutic option provides the choice for a human being to receive that affirmation, 
then we need to get about making it available as quickly as possible. And that's my position. I have so many questions. It's so hard to know where to start. Okay. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed the podcast, please like, comment, subscribe, and share. And make sure to let me know what guests you want to see on in the future.